And incidentally, whenever God uses an illustration, you can figure it's a good one. Sometimes we preachers use illustrations and we have to say, well, that's a good illustration, but it breaks down along the way. When God uses an illustration, you don't have any problems with it. It's a good illustration. And God here in 1 Corinthians 14 says, even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, whether flute or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? God says that you, when you do music, you make it distinct, you make it clear. And what he is saying is then that you ought to make your language just as clear as you make the music. In fact, in verse 8, he says, For if the trumpet give a, an uncertain sound, if the trumpet doesn't make the, the sound clear, you're not going to know what you're supposed to do. For instance, he says, Who shall prepare himself to the battle? Now, I've got a couple of illustrations that you'll be very familiar with, but let me just show you what we're talking about. Does that mean you're supposed to go to bed? Or how about this? Does that mean you're supposed to get up? You say, well, uh, that's conditioning. To a certain degree it is, but there's something innate, something inherent in the sound that lets you know what you're supposed to be doing. And this is what the scripture is saying. That even when you use a trumpet, you want to make it absolutely distinct. You want to make it clear so people know what they're supposed to do. And this is where I think folks have gotten confused today. They think the music doesn't make any difference. They say, as long as the words are right, why the music does No, Scripture makes it clear that the music has its own message, and we're going to talk about that today as well. Go down to verse 11 of chapter 14, and you will find that Paul goes even further. He says, if I know not the meaning of the voice. The word meaning there is a very interesting Greek word. It's the Greek word dunamis. What it means is power. Paul used that in Romans 1.16, where he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? The power, the dunamis of God unto salvation. It's the same word here. And what I think Paul is saying is that language has tremendous power, and so does music. You've heard the saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. You've heard that? Might be a nice saying, but it isn't true. You say, why? There are adults sitting in this audience right now that when you were young, someone said something to you that hurt you very deeply, and you still haven't gotten over it. Words have power. And when scripture says that words have power, I think it's also saying that music has tremendous power. The world knows that. <laughs> Try watching your TV sometime and turn the sound off and see how much you get out of the program. They realize that the sound has tremendous power over the listener. I want to show you a couple of interesting books. This one's called The World is Sound. The World is Sound. This is a secular book, and most of the quotes that I'm going to give you, in fact, I will label them, most of the quotes I'm going to give you are not from Christian people. <laughs> I'm not trying to use folks who agree with me from a Christian standpoint. I'm using folks who are in the secular realm, particularly folks who are in the area of communication, who know what is happening in this area of music. Because this man says, the word logos, in the beginning was the word. In the Greek, it also means sound. Sound, very important. And he says that the discovery that space is filled with sound was made with modern radio telescopes. The universe is filled with sound. The sound of our solar system is precisely the sound of our earthbound music. You take our musical principles that we use for making music in our churches, principles that are based not only on the Word of God, but upon good musical principles. This man says the solar system is built upon the same principles. In fact, he says that 74 of the 78 tones created by the planetary proportions belong to the major scale. Just like we have a major scale in music. A configuration, he says, that no chance in the world would be able to explain. And he's an evolutionist. But he recognizes that that could not have possibly have happened by chance. No way. He says the sound spectrum of the six visible planets, including the Earth, covers eight octaves, almost identical with the human hearing range. Isn't that interesting? 
that the solar system is built on the same principles that yours and my hearing range is. Then he says that harmony is the goal of the universe. God has made it that way. Here's another book. This one's a music physician for times to come. This is a rather new age book, but I think, again, using these quotes makes it more valid than if I just quoted Christians. This book says that everything is in a state of vibration and is saying something. Everything. In fact, it says there are harmonics in a stone and the same laws that made the stone made you and me. <laughs> and again, this is an evolutionist who recognizes that all the way through nature, the same principles exist. And I think if we recognize that, then we have to realize that it is God who has made these things. And what we must find out then is what is acceptable to him. Because the word proving means to test. God wants us to test things. Some folks say, well, you do that, you're judging. No, judging is passing sentence on somebody or something. And although the Bible does ask us to do that in certain places, that's not what this is talking about. God wants us to test things. We test everything else, and I think we ought to test music as well. And that music ought to be what? Acceptable unto whom? Unto whom? The Lord. So many folks say, this is just a matter of personal preference. <laughs> you like your kind of music, I like my kind of music. Who's to say one's right and one's wrong? I hope before we get through today in these three messages, you'll realize that that is a worldly philosophy that does not belong in Christian circles. There are principles that God has laid down for us in every area of life, and one of those areas is music. But because folks have not proven what is acceptable to God, they've come up with the idea that music is amoral. Sometimes they use the term amoral, just a different way of pronouncing the same word. Sometimes they say it's neutral. Sometimes they say it's non-moral. Uh, this is a basic philosophy that we need to address because this, I think, is the root of the problem in so much so-called Christian music today. Because what they are saying is that there is no good or bad music. Incidentally, no generation has believed that until this one. You go back and check it historically. You can go back as far as you want. And no generation. In fact, I'm going to give you some quotes from clear back to the Old Testament, back to the time of Moses, <laughs> that will show that there's no way that music could be amoral and that there is no good or bad music. And this idea that there is no good or bad music is coming from the CCM people who want to accept everything they, they have. Because they, you talk to them, they say, but I like it. Let me ask you a question. Does the fact that you like it make it good? No. There are a whole bunch of things that I like that I don't do because I know they're wrong. Or else, some folks say, I don't like it. Some people say to me, the reason you're against rock music, you just don't like it. It has nothing to do with it. Or in this area of CCM particularly, they'll say, but I get a blessing from it. <laughs> now, this is not a trick question, folks. But does the fact that they get a blessing from it make it good? Yeah. See, I've had people tell me they got a blessing out of Jesus Christ Superstar. Incidentally, I thought that thing was going to be gone years ago. It's right back again. It was on television again this Easter. It's come back very popular. It has not faded at all. Because it's a false doctrine. It's a false Christ. Now, even if they did get a blessing, I question their blessing. But even if they did get a blessing, would that make Superstar a good thing? Where Mary Magdalene in her song in that opera says about Jesus Christ, she's supposed to be a prostitute in the opera. And in, the, in, the, uh, in her song called I Don't Know How to Love Him, she says, he's a man, he's just a man, and I've had so many men before. In very many ways, he's just one more. Talking about Jesus Christ. I mean, that's terrible blasphemy, folks. But I have people tell me they got a blessing out of that. I've had people get up and walk out of my meetings mad at me because I mentioned there's something wrong with Superstar. Huh. You see, the problem is they've tried to say that music is amoral. I checked out several dictionaries. Let me just give you a quote from one of them. This is a secular dictionary, not a Christian dictionary. It says, amoral means incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong. And is that ever true? You watch the people who go into the CCM and allow it in their church, and you watch the other standards of separation go down the drain too. They'll go right along with it. I could give you all kinds of examples of that. Huh. Robert Shaw, 
probably the greatest choral conductor of the 20th century, and Kurt Wetzel, who co-authored our book with me, and when he and I asked him in New York City when we were with him what he believed about the morality of music, you know what he said? I believe all the arts are moral. I can't see how any of the arts can be neutral. He recognized the morality of music. Van Cliburn said the language of music is readable, it's writable, and it's recitable. 